uh, we will take uh, questions. Uh, uh, Rajiv, yeah. we'll take two questions uh, and then, yeah. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for your very uh, emphatic and incisive uh, remarks, uh, Mr. Goel. It was heartening to hear uh, not only your current vision that you and your party have, but the vision that perhaps Atalji had, which may have remained uh, unfulfilled in many areas, as pointed out by you. I have a very straightforward and simple question. You highlighted you know, three or four uh, main uh, mega issues which you would like to take forward. Uh, can we take for granted that A, this has been discussed internally amongst your party, that it's been endorsed by your prime ministerial uh, nominee, and that it'll find uh, a clear mention in your, in your manifesto. And of course, finally, if all this is yes, 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 then good luck to you. Mm -hmm. Ravi Sir, I want to talk to you about two issues, one about the past, another about the future. You know that we people from industry are deeply saddened by the fact mm -hmm. that over the last five years, the, the economy has taken yeah. such a nosedive, and it has cost the nation a lot. We can keep going into the reason why it happened. But I think that as responsible representatives of people sitting in the, in the parliament, I, we would expect that the, the ruling party and the opposition, they should at least evolve some minimum common program which is in the national interest and sort of it transcends over any other interest of a political party. That is something which has not happened. You know, let me give you an example. You know, for so many years we have been talking about implementing DTC, and, and uh, GST, and that there's a broad consensus between both BJP and as well as the ruling party that it should be done. But for some very you know, strange reason, it, it has never seen the light of the day. Now we are pushing it over to the next government which is going to come. So I think on behalf of industry, it's our very, very you know, fervent appeal to you, regardless of whether you come into power, you stay in opposition to make sure that you drive this movement for developing a minimum national agenda, which should not be subject of discussion, because this is, it is costing this nation hugely. That's number one. Going forward for future, you know, the, we are very happy that your party, BJP as well as NDA, are, you know, are, are very vocal about re-energizing the economy. You're focusing a lot on uh, the increasing growth and employment. Mm -hmm. I think this sounds like music to our ears. But there's one, th and then you, of course, talked about in the last part of your speech, uh, governance, improving governance. You know that when we talk about improving governance, we can't take a view from an altitude of 12,000 feet. We have to see how governance is implemented at the ground level. You know, and if you look at the third party, political party, which is emerging on the scene, they are talking about how the governance will improve at the ground level. So why can't NDA and BJP also, you know, emulate the example to see that we could also implement governance to, in the same. There's nothing to, wrong to sort of emulate yeah, yeah. any good example. You know, because what we worry is why you will drive the growth agenda, but the social inequities will continue. There will be inefficiency in implementation because there's such a widespread, you know, the corruption all over. So my, my humble submission is that if your party can be equally vocal about implementing the governance, you know, improving the governance in the country. Anshman, the three questions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Piyush, you mentioned about uh, housing and uh, infrastructure. What is your party's view on Land Acquisition Act? Because you need land for putting a power plant or factory or even do housing or office. Uh, and you know, uh, there's been a lot of debate on this. So what, what is your party's view on that? Uh, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, very clearly, if I have said something, it is not uh, top of my hat. It's certainly something we are very seized of. We are very seized of the responsibility as a political party aiming to win this election and form the next government in terms of having synergy of thought amongst the top leadership, it's something we have been deliberating and discussing. We have crowdsourced ideas from across the nation. Uh, we got something like 40,000 responses when we went across the nation looking for ideas. We have talked to chambers of commerce, including your very own uh, CII, and all other national and state level chambers. We've engaged a lot of experts from different fields. I myself have talked to many people, some of whom are in this room, 
on different occasions on sector specific issues where we felt we were ill equipped to take a final call. A beautiful vision has been articulated. It's in the final stages of drafting. We have also very clear plans of how do we break this blockchain? What do we do to reignite the investment cycle? I mean, for example, the other day I was deliberating with the finance ministry officials, and I said, look, one statement by your ministry, which says that if any person, any industrialist, has a NPA in one company, all banks will stop lending to all his companies. Now, you have a person who's ventured, unfortunately now, into the power sector. And you have not given him environment clearance or land or water or possibly allowed his mining lease to be cleared. It's like a force majeure. Force majeure today is not only an act of God, it's an act of government also. Now he's stuck in a log jam for no fault of his. And now you are saying that all is profitable and other businesses also should be squeezed. And you want to create six other NPAs or potential CDRs just because he had the misfortune someday of conceptualizing a power plant. I mean, these are, this is the type of short-sighted thinking this government has indulged in. Banks are micromanaged from Delhi. Freedom and autonomy is not given. One day, an investigative officer makes a statement that all accounts which are stressed are going to be investigated. So, jo chote bote decision lete the bank wale wo bhi band kar diya. It pays not to take a decision. If you take a decision, you go to jail. Not now, maybe 10 years later. So they say, we are getting our salary. Why do we take a decision? And these are practical on the ground things. Now they claim to have approved 257 projects worth 150,000 crores, right? There's been a lot of Tom Tomming. You might have had it earlier part of the day also. But those projects, not one has got off the ground. I asked the finance secretary, name one project which has gone off the ground. And he didn't have an answer. The problem is projects are long delayed. Financial sanctions have lapsed. The promoters don't have more money to bring in their share of equity. Banks don't want to reassess those projects because half of them have Supreme Court cases going on. So that just approving the environment approval, giving the environment approval from a committee is not good enough. You have to think holistically how we are going to sort out the entire problem. Will government support, as they do many times in various countries, like they did in the US, maybe for the automobile industry, that in a panic situation, government has to step in, maybe provide some seed capital. I remember I ran industry 25 years ago. IDBI used to provide seed capital to small entrepreneurs like me as seed capital, or you know, to engineers and working professionals. So government will have to think innovatively that if this 10 lakh, 20 lakh, 15 lakh, I've lost track of numbers, if all these projects have to be kick-started, what are those interventions within a given time frame which can actually kick-start that? So I promise you we are very conscious. All of us have experience. I personally have been in manufacturing. I've been an investment banker. I am rather an investment banker. I still do that for a living. So I tell you we are conscious of the realities of the situation, but we will not sacrifice national interest in order to speed this up. So we'll have to balance the nation's interest and the interests of kickstarting growth and getting all these projects off the ground. So we certainly will have to have processes in place, like the gentleman said. We'll have to have transparent processes, fair processes, which are equal for all. The opportunity should be equal for all. And uh, it's, it's a well bought in agenda amongst the top leadership of the party. Uh, Mr. Modi personally is a very good listener and I tell you I have a small example four five days back I was with him late night one day and I was suggesting that we should throw this idea into the manifesto a particular issue he said no but we haven't studied this in detail I don't want to say it in the manifesto unless I'm clear how I will do it I said Modi ji kar lenge na itni koi difficult nahi hai I'm very clear how we can do it he said Piyush maine ek highway Gujarat ke manifesto mein dala tha. Ek saal ho gaya, wo shuru nahi kar pa raho. I'm having some difficulties and it is haunting me. One road project in his Gujarat highway is haunting Mr. Modi because he hasn't been able to kickstart it one year from after the elections. So he's very clear. He wants to give a practical agenda. 
And when we come with that agenda, and I, any one of the issues that I've highlighted today, I'm open to any amount of scrutiny in any great detail from all of you here to justify how each one of those things we are going to implement. So we have well thought of it, and we promise you that nothing fanciful or nothing, uh, nothing is a dream. It's all real to-do plans that we have. Uh, well, the suggestion about a common minimum program is an excellent suggestion, sir. But certainly, you will have to grant us our responsibility. While we were in opposition, and even when we come into power, if we should get your blessings, to maintain integrity and probity of systems, to respect institutions of integrity, and not have a situation where a government of the day <coughs> indulges in massive corruption, and when it is being highlighted, and not highlighted based on press or media reports, highlighted based on credible auditor reports, the CAG reports, the government wants to push it under the carpet. When we ask questions in and out of parliament, we are given prepared texts. Ministers refuse to answer any question. If you will see any debate, whether it's on the 2G spectrum, whether it's on Colgate, Antris Devas, I can name 50 scams. We ask tons and tons of questions. A statement would be read out, which did not address a single question being raised. And were it not for the active, active role of the opposition, and sometimes obstructing parliament is necessary in national interest also to bring to fore what is happening in government. Otherwise, they will, they will just run amok with bad governance. So I think it was our duty to highlight that. The courts are finally seized of the matter. I don't know if you're aware, most of these investigations weren't even started till it was highlighted in parliament. So we are doing our job. And I promise you, if we come into government, I am not worried about the Congress doing the same thing, because I won't allow them an opportunity. I'll run the government in a transparent fashion. I won't be giving out licenses and natural resources to a favored few out of all of you sitting here. It will be process driven. You will all have a fair shot at it. And we would like all of you to succeed. We are not looking at one or two of the other of you succeeding at the cost of the others. Of course, uh, there's a lot of possibility in terms of simplification in DTC that is still possible. My standing committee on finance, headed by Yashwan Sinha, actually highlighted the flaws in the DTC bill that was proposed. Uh, ENY helped me a lot in that, ENY, KPMG, all of them. We came out with a report. After receiving the report, the Honorable Finance Minister brought out GAR. Now, GAR per se is not bad, but the way administration of taxation is there in India, it could have been draconian. Similarly, GST. I mean, we are not against GST, but we do have to address four or five issues about the federal structure. Should there be a calamity in, in Andhra Pradesh, a tsunami in Tamil Nadu, and they need money to, for the welfare of the affected people, what should that chief minister do? Should the chief minister go and beg before an arrogant person at the helm of affairs in Delhi, or a silent prime minister who doesn't take decisions and let the people suffer? Or should it wait for somebody in, out of government to say that, oh, what money we have given from the center for sorting out the earthquake or tsunami is our money. We have given you that money. It's after all the people's money and the people have a right to that money. It's not individuals who are giving that money. So in the event of natural calamities, how will GST function? How will it function vis-a-vis -vis merit goods and demerit goods? How will it function in terms of the autonomy of the states? Will the center, and does the center have the credibility, based on the past experience, of, of making up the loss of revenue for the producing states, vis-a-vis -vis the consuming states? These are all issues that have been flagged off, that need to be addressed. And I think if the consensus building exercise is done with sincerity, so these they, issues can be the, sorted out. You know, obviously there are issues which have to be resolved amicably. I mean, you know, we have discussed this for more than five years now. Isn't that adequate time to find resolution of these problems? That's the question. I would urge I you mean, to give us some solutions. We are absolutely open to these questions that I raised. So tomorrow if you come into the government, Maybe. I'm sure you're going to address this. Well, we'll certainly address it. And we stand committed to GST with these issues resolved in a spirit of consensus with the states. 
Well, your idea is about emulating another party is very good. We are open to learning lessons from any party. But certainly we are not learning lessons to let the Republic Day parade go haywire. We are certainly not going against the Constitution of India, which we are very proud of. We are certainly not looking at an anarchical situation. And we certainly don't believe that there's a one-size-fits-all solution to everything. So I don't think the country can hear just one dialogue for every problem and assume that that one dialogue will solve all our problems. We need to think in a much wider canvas. We need to address certainly the issue of corruption. And we have honorably done that. You can ask anybody who's seen our governments, particularly in Gujarat under Mr. Modi, the way that state is administered, the way people are enjoying to do business th there, the way agriculture, manufacturing, all are in double-digit growth for 10 years, a decadal CAGR in double-digit. No large state in India has had this kind of a dream run, including Gujarat in the past, what Gujarat has seen in the last 12 years. I think we have a track record based on which we are going to the people, and I think we have a leader whom people will be able to trust based on his track record. I don't think we need to just make fanciful statements or anarchical comments on the system. The system is the same in Gujarat as anywhere else in the country. The bureaucrats are the same in Gujarat as in the rest of the country. It's visionary, honest leadership that makes the difference. And that is what we propose to provide the nation. Uh, on housing, uh, Anshuman, you had a fair point. On land acquisition, my personal view is we needed to increase the compensation to make it more real and make it reflective of the current land values. But we should have simultaneously simplified the process. What we have landed up creating is a process which will be impossible in the timelines given. Fortunately, thanks to Mr. Arun Jetli, who intervened at the last minute and forced the government's hand to at least allow those seven or eight infrastructure sectors to remain out of the purview of this Land Acquisition Act. It's thanks to that that at least Vinayak Chatterjee and Ajit Gulabchand's business may continue for some more years before the processes of the new Land Acquisition Act get, get kind of clarified in courts and sorted out. But I think what we will have to do, should we get an opportunity, is to try and cut the, you know, the, the process into more simplified versions, be fair to the dispossessed landowners, give them a fair deal. And again, Gujarat is an example. When Mr. Ratan Tata went to Gujarat, he was welcomed by the landowners with open arms because we could explain to them what these projects will mean for them in terms of their own incomes. And we brought agriculture, land expanded in Gujarat. So with the agriculturist who lost his land near the cities or in Sanan was able to go and do agriculture a little behind, maybe 10, 20 kilometers away. So agricultural production has not suffered. Manufacturing industry and business has flourished. And the landowners got back a part of that developed land on which they're having tertiary incomes, maybe in, in form of small hotels, small businesses. So I think there's always a better way to do things. It only needs an open mind and a willingness to listen to experts such as yourself rather than believe that we are the repository of all intelligence. And that I can promise you neither Mr. Modi is and none of us is. If any of you has had a chance to meet with Mr. Modi, he's an excellent listener. He listens for 95% of the time you will spend with him. He wants to learn, he wants to know from you. Maybe the poor Chaiwala didn't go to Harvard or Wharton, but he certainly has an inane human sense, an on-the-ground real sense of understanding what are the real issues which need to be tackled. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Rajiv Memani, Salil, and uh, Sumit. Three quick questions. Uh, Piyush, no, I had a question on GST, which I think has, uh, has we've had a long debate on that. I think it's certainly, I do believe like Ravi that I think we should have got over this hump long back. Uh, I also wanted to get your views on foreign direct investment. Uh, in the past, we have known uh, uh, BJP to be encouraging uh, foreign investment. Uh, we know of your views on retail, uh, on insurance also. One hears that you're not really in favor of increasing foreign investment. So it will be good to get perspective on that. 
And also, I don't want to hold you on, but if Vodafone was to move into conciliation and move out of conciliation and everything else, then you know, how do you see that panning out? Because that will have a real impact on how India is perceived uh, outside. So, sure. so sorry for getting, it no, was a simpler sorry? question, I, for getting into details. Please ask the most inconvenient question. I'm okay. Salil. Salil. My question is on agriculture. Biggest challenge on the supply chain from farm to the fork. Uh, the, the message from the uh, BJP on FDI is a little disturbing because that upsets the value chain all the way. So what is your plan on agriculture, which to my mind is the key to the problem of inflation and the poor man's uh, food issues? Sumit? Sum uh, about the steps that you talked about, the first one you talked about is creation of jobs, which I think all of us agree. And then you also talked about manufacturing, and you were quite passionate about that, because manufacturing does create the maximum number of jobs. And I believe the expression you use is, find the p uh, pain points and, and start a plug and play uh, mm. system. But the states get very much involved in really setting up manufacturing plants. And you know the setup in our country. So how, I, I'm just curious, how, what is your plan on tackling this issue? Because different states have different policies. Sure. Rules. How do we get to a uniform policy? Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, on FDI, Rajiv, very clearly, if you map the last 25 years since 1991 and put the FDI or reform or the opening up process into buckets, I don't think you will find a comparable period to NDA between 99 and 2004. The true opening up of infrastructure, the aviation open skies policy, the Electricity Reform Act, banking, insurance, pension, that all started during that period. After the initial flush of removing licenses by Mr. Uh, Manmohan Singh and Mr. Narsimha Rao in 91 to 94, I think 94 the government got into a hiatus, got too political, they were preparing for elections, then we had two third front governments, and I'm sure all of you are now well versed with the impact of such ragmatol coalitions that India has faced four of them in the last few years. But Mr. Vajpayee did that in a spirit of consensus. No reform by Mr. Vajpayee was sought to be bulldozed through parliament or otherwise. Every reform was with a spirit of discussion, negotiation, consultation, and he took the principal opposition party into confidence. After all, why did none of that get stalled? Take insurance, since you have specifically flagged off insurance. Mr. Yashwan Sinha brought the insurance FDI regulation to propose 49% FDI in insurance. It went to the standing committee, then led by a person who's currently a member of parliament in, my, in the upper house, was a minister until recently, and very close to the first family. He came back to Mr. Vajpayee with a proposal from the government and mind you, Mr. Manmohan Singh was the leader of opposition in the Rajya Sabha at that point of time. He, he came back with a proposal that my leader, and we all know who the leader of the Congress was, and my party is not willing to allow 49% FDI in insurance. We are only willing to go 26%. Mr. Vajpayee, in his spirit of cooperation, appreciated that he cannot bulldoze it through the Rajya Sabha without the support of the Congress. Apart from that, he generally believed that, okay, wiser counsel will prevail over a period of time. Let's start with 26. And that's how insurance opened up in India. Now, when the insurance sector opened up, certain, certain promises, certain dreams were made. Certain commitments were made in terms of what will be the investment flow. What will be the impact of opening up insurance? In 2010, yeah, I joined parliament in 10. So either 10 or early 11, this government introduced. And why did this government, after all, from 2004 until 2010, sleep over the increase from 26 to 49 under compulsions of coalition politics? They brought in a possible amendment to 49 only in 10 or 11. It came to our standing committee of finance. I promise all of you, 
we went into that committee meeting, expecting that it was our policy, we'll make it 49, we'll approve it. And we had presentations by the government of India, by the insurance companies themselves, the private insurers, by IRDA, also by the, by the Chamber of Commerce, which, which represents US-India interests. They all made rep uh, presentations to us. And lo and behold, what do we find? We found the private insurance companies had brought in all of $1.2 billion in 10 years of opening up, nine or 10 years. All of $1.2 billion into the country. What had they done? We did not find one unique insurance product that they were able to show our committee. I'm not deriding insurance companies, by the way. You may, some of you may own insurance companies. I wish you had done better. I wish you had been more sensitive to the needs of India, rather than, and I say it because I am a sufferer also of the misdemeanors of the private insurance companies, rather than just missell insurance policies of the ULIP variety, the, the savings and insurance link products, rather than cheat people with 40-40% premiums, first premiums, going to the insurance company, rather than get people to surrender policies after two or three years to shore up their profitability or reduce their losses since none of them ever made profit. What we found at the end of those four or five presentations was insurance had not lived up to the expectations. The second thing, there is media here, but I still say it. I've said it publicly on record many times. Second thing that agitated our committee was that the government refused to allow sanitized insurance valuation norms. I mean, insurance companies, as all of you gentlemen and ladies are aware, are not valued on discounted cash flows. Janmeja, it's, it's an embedded value that you create over a period of time in insurance companies. We asked the government, why don't you stipulate world accepted insurance valuation norms? And why don't you insist, since you are tom-toming, that we need more investment and all of you want to suggest to me that without FDI, the country has no future. So you want FDI to come in, right? So were we supposed to ask, get more FDI, post the insurance opening up to 49? Or were we supposed to legitimize potential transactions which had brought in that FDI earlier in various forms, Rajiv, you and I, are both aware of that, and most people in this room are aware of. All that we said was, bring in credible insurance valuation norms and like ask people to bring in fresh FDI when they want to increase from 26 to 49%. Can any of you tell me what is wrong in our demand? And it was a unanimous report, 30 MPs, every political party was represented in that committee, and for your information, Indian parliaments work through the standing committees. We are non-partisan. We work with a common national interest. And all of us were unanimous in rejecting 49%. The government, again, in 2013, brought in 49%. In the interest of allowing it to happen and supporting reform, we agreed with certain caveats, very, very nominal caveats, and then the government slept over. So it's not that we are against 49%, ladies and gentlemen. We want national interest to be protected when you bring in that 49. FDI on retail, we have discussed ad nauseum. We are convinced and clear in our mind, just like we read in, you know, in various books about what has happened to manufacturing in different parts of the world post uh, large scale multi-brand FDI. And certainly in an environment where India is losing jobs in manufacturing. Indian manufacturing is finding it uncompetitive. <laughs> when you juxtapose ourselves to China or the Philippines or Thailand, when wages are also rising, but at 15%, 14% interest, with all the bottlenecks on logistics and infrastructure, Indian manufacturing is not able to come out of its, its problems. Labor laws are causing us to remain small, not have economies of scale. And then in that atmosphere, if these foreign retailers and they source worldwide, Rajiv, you're aware of that. So when they want maybe a 
5 million, 10 million order of these cups and they don't get it, they'll import it. They won't find a manufacturer here because we never allowed the clock manufacturers and the cup manufacturers to grow in scale. So we believe we need to strengthen Indian manufacturing first. We believe we need to have a situation where people have jobs and job losses don't become the bane of a future India before we can bring FDI and multi-brand retail. The problems that somebody mentioned about uh, uh, the agricultural supply chain, well, we didn't have uh, FDI even in 2000 to 2004 in agriculture, but prices were low. Inflation was at two or three percent. Food inflation was almost non-existent. I don't think that's the only reason. The other day I asked a government official, a secretary in the finance ministry, what is the shortage of food grain storage in India? And what will it cost to set it right? Will you gentlemen believe it's only 25 million tons and it needs 10,000 crores? This government of India estimate. Probably you would do it better. I would rather spend 10,000 crores and sort it out. None of these foreign Walmarts or uh, foreign companies coming into FDI and multi-brand retail are in any case going to invest in that back end until it is profitable. Or if at all private sector has to be involved, I would work on it like the power sector. For the initial years, I would give you an assured 16% return on capital to encourage you to set up cold storages and warehouses, at least in the initial period till it is uneconomical. We need to set agriculture right, not by bringing FTI. We need to give them better quality seeds in time. We need to give them knowledge. We need to help the soil cards be created so that nutritional quality is maintained. We need to set the fertilizer pricing right. You can't have a situation, urea is subsidized. All others are made 400% costlier. So farmers are pumping urea into their fields and the entire soil of the country is getting degenerated. We need to think through the problem of agriculture and find credible solutions on the ground. Of course, um, the state's issue that you flagged off, I think states will ultimately have to get into competitive economic development. It's when Gujarat develops and develops rapidly that you find other states trying to emulate that. So the central government will have to make it easy to do business and businesses will find the right place and the right mix of state support to be able to succeed. And believe me, it's end of the day a competitive world. We want you to flourish in an open competitive environment. If even two or three states enable you to perform well, the others will fall in line, otherwise the public of that state will throw that government out and get a government which will help businesses and jobs to be created over there. So I'm fairly confident states will fall in line. You have states which threw out car plants earlier, now talking of industrialization. So it's, it's something where competition will bring it in. Uh, you did ask me about Vodafone. I'm sorry, Rajiv, I, it remained to be addressed. I think it's a problem of this government's making. My party, Mr. Arun Jetli and I are the only two people and we had the unfortunate misfortune of being covered on some, some magazine trying to suggest that we had some vested interests in Vodafone, which I have not been able to crack. But we were the only two people who stood on the floor of parliament, opposed the retroactive amendments. We could visualize that, and, I, and you can read my speech, it's on my website. I, could, I told the Honorable Finance Minister, sir, you are looking at a billion or two or five billion dollars, but in the process, you're causing the nation an agony in excess of $100 billion by bringing in this type of a move. Well, after a whole speech, my head is falling quickly, so my head is falling But at the end of the day, all I got from the finance minister was wholesome praise, no solution, and, the, and a comment that I have the right to make a retroactive amendment. And I stood up to tell him, sir, I'm not contesting your right to do it. But that right is costing this nation dear. We are stuck with a logjam. It is a situation which this government could have rectified very easily. I, I mean, off the camera, I'll tell you what could have been done better. But going forward, once, if we do get your blessings and we are seized of that problem, we'll find a solution. We don't run away from problems. We'll find solutions to these problems. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Piyush Goyal. You know, it's not the first time CI is interacting with you. Um, I think uh, you know we, we have been interacting with you, and this has been an outstanding, outstanding interaction. I have many more people wanting to ask questions, but uh, unfortunately, time has um, run out. You know, we have submitted our uh, uh, you know economic uh, agenda for the political manifesto, and we would like to see um, better um, cooperation and better understanding of uh, uh, the industry's uh, requirements in this regard. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking Mr. Piyush Goel for an outstanding, outstanding interaction. Thank you very much.